afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Adnan Haider. I'm the Senior Associate Dean for Research here at the George Washington Milken Institute School of Public Health and Professor of Global Health. It's my great pleasure to moderate this session, uh, which is presented by colleagues from uh, the Milken Institute School of Public Health. But we hope that all of you who are attending today, and I already see over 100 people in attendance, um, represent uh, membership of faculty, staff, and students from across uh, GW. So welcome to uh, this webinar. It's a great pleasure to moderate COVID campus screening, data metrics, and support science symposium. Uh, the goal of this symposium today is really to demonstrate uh, the science behind the planning, the preparation, and the operations that are going to go about um, in response to the current pandemic with respect to our university um, and our various schools at GW. This is incredibly important for us to actually understand the evidence base behind the actions that we all take as a community. And we are so fortunate that actually uh, we don't have to struggle to find experts in various fields, but we have them right here on our campus and very much so from our school as well. So today's webinar will focus on the contributions of the School of Public Health in this way. And I will be uh, moderating this uh, in the following manner. We will have a series of five speakers um, today. So please be patient as you hear them. What I'd like you to do is if you have a thought, you have a reflection, you have a question, please jot it down. And if at all possible, put it on the chat board. Uh, myself, as well as my colleagues, uh, a couple of my colleagues are going to monitor the chat board for your questions, for your thoughts, and we will pick that up in our Q&A session once all five speakers have made their presentations. Uh, the presentations follow a, an order uh, which we believe is reasonably logical, so we hope that they build on each other. We hope that many of your questions will actually be answered during the presentations. But we are also looking for a robust discussion at the end, which I hope um, to moderate. Um, again, if there are any technical difficulties during the next couple of hours, please be patient. Uh, we have a couple of our colleagues dedicated to looking after those. We will sort them out as soon as possible and restart just in case if there are any issues. So I'm really delighted uh, to kickstart this webinar by inviting uh, Dean Goldman uh, to really lay the overview of the public health approach and the public health science. Um, Dr. Goldman is the Michael and Laurie Milken Dean of the Milken Institute School of Public Health. Uh, from many of you may know, uh, she's not only just Dean, but she has been a professor and a scientist for her career. She's been a leader thinker, leading thinker in environmental health sciences, and is really now uh, leading not only the School of Public Health, but the GW community in exploring how to address uh, reopening and thinking about uh, addressing this pandemic. So, uh, Dr. Goldman, over to you for uh, giving us an overview of the public health approach. Thank you so much for that introduction and if we can go to the next slide. So in holding this symposium, we recognize that uh, as we had been presenting the campus reopening plan and the red team review so-called, there were many, many questions uh, related to science and I thought it would be interesting for many in our community to hear more about the approaches that we've been taking. Um, this is so basic, it's embarrassing, but obviously COVID-19 is a disease caused by a virus called the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is a group four positive sense um, single-stranded RNA virus. There is no vaccine. Uh, we have medication that helps ameliorate the effects of the virus, but no real cure. And it's a very sneaky virus. And we know that in China, where the first outbreaks occurred, that many of the known infections were from undocumented cases, did not, could not figure out where they were coming from. We also know that it can be hidden and present for, for in the air for days or, or, or hours. Um, and so going to the next slide. So, Asymptomatic transmission. Um, this was something that uh, very much went against our uh, prior assumptions. But really early on, even in China, they noted that a lot of people um, who were transmitting the virus either did not yet manifest symptoms, they were pre-symptomatic, they were not aware they had symptoms, maybe they were just mildly symptomatic, or they just never had symptoms at all. They were asymptomatic. 
You hear a lot of confusion in the press about those terms, but you know, it's really the same thing. If you're a person you don't know you have symptoms, and you're wandering around and infecting others, it really doesn't matter whether it's, you know, which of those three it is. So the CDC documented uh, pre-symptomatic transmission actually um, in Singapore where they did precise contact tracing of several cases uh, back in March and did find that a fraction of those cases, they couldn't find anybody with symptoms who knew them. And they then did hypothesize that uh, speech or vocal activities or environmental contamination from somebody who didn't yet have symptoms was um, the cause. And so social distancing became a recommendation. Next slide. So there's been a struggle to develop a cl the clinical criteria for diagnosis. And I'm not gonna read this entire slide to you, but I'm showing it to you to illustrate how complex it is to try to use clinical criteria to diagnose this infection. And if you notice, there are these combinations of symptoms and then an and, no alternative, more likely diagnosis. Well, um, all of these symptom combinations, there are other very likely diagnosis, except perhaps the last one, the clinical radiographic evidence of pneumonia or, or, or acute respiratory disease, but most of it is in these milder categories. Autopsy findings, that's not that helpful for public health. It's a little late to prevent it at that point. Next slide. And then there's the laboratory um, uh, criteria that it's either detecting the RNA in um, a person, detecting the viral antigen, the actual protein for the virus in the person, or detecting the antibody um, in the blood or serum of the person that indicates that recently you had an infection. Next slide. And there's epidemiologic linkage, which is how they were doing it at the beginning, kind of circumstantial evidence. You were traveling in an area with a lot of circulation, or you had close contact with someone, or um, that you're a member of a risk cohort, such as you know, you're, in, you're living in an assisted living community where there's an outbreak. You're a part of that cohort. Um, and then after the fact, when you, if someone dies, there is an, an ability to use vital records in order to try to infer that it might have been due to uh, the COVID-19 um, disease. Next slide. So the fact is, and, and this really also went against our preconceived notion, our preconceived notion was that big respiratory droplets are being coughed or sneezed and that these big droplets are ending up on in places where we're going to touch those and then we're going to touch our noses and we're going to get infected that way. But it turns out that most of the transmission isn't big droplets but little ones like the ones that this gentleman is coughing out and the first clue of that really um, was of course from the, the data in Wuhan, China that I showed you already, that the, and in Singapore, and that transmission was happening, you couldn't find any contact. But uh, the people at the University of Nebraska who took care of people off of one of the cruise ships measured the virus in the air in the patient's rooms and found these aerosols with viable virus in the air in the room. And uh, that was a pretty clear signal that there's aerosol transmission that happened a few months ago. And in Guangdong, and I'm sorry, I, I misspelled that, Guangdong, China, in a restaurant, there was an outbreak that was documented where actually two tables where families were dining that were pretty far apart, but where there was a very active HVAC system, it blew the virus obviously from one table to the next. There's no other possible explanation. The wait staff weren't infected. The only people infected were the people in the one table that was kind of upwind from the people in the other table. So we've actually you know, known this for a while and it's just been kind of taken a while for the official agencies, WHO and CDC to conclude that indeed this is the case. Next slide. So when we speak, we generate particles and interestingly, the louder we talk, the more particles we generate. And so those of you who grew up with the expression, say it, don't spray it, you're aware of this. 
but it's not the spray that you can feel. It is the tinier particles, microscopic aerosols, that are of most concern. And it just goes to show how important physicists are to public health, too. Next slide. So this is from a very large study that was recently published in Nature out of the UK, where they are able to look at millions of people through the fact that they have a national health system and some single records. But, and you can very clearly see after adjusting for chronic diseases and race and ethnicity and poverty and everything else, that age is the most powerful predictor of death from COVID-19. And I think that's true in population after population. And where they took those between 50 and 60 as kind of the norm, but look how less likely you are to die if you're younger than 50. So at each decade, there's an uptick in risk. And particular for people over the age of 80 who are 20 times more likely to die than people between 50 and 60. Another very consistent finding is this excess of risk for males that um, might have to do with some of the things that Dr. Liu is gonna talk about in terms of how the virus uses receptors in order to um, get into cells and infect them. Next slide. The other thing that they found that is very consistent is that you know, chronic diseases, I picked out one of them, obesity, you know, is a risk factor. Even after controlling for age and sex and everything else, you're two times more likely to die if you're obese and about 1.4 times um, if you are overweight. And, the, and also consistent across um, many countries that race is an issue, uh, probably um, having to do with chronic disease, and, but also having to do probably with stress. But even in the UK, that Blacks and South Asians and people who call themselves mixed race are more likely to die of COVID. Next slide. So the Spanish flu, the last large pandemic we had, came in multiple waves, and the second one was much worse than the first one. And um, as I said a few months ago, we're likely to have multiple curves of COVID-19. Next slide. So this is from the CDC website, and this is currently what the pandemic looks like now from the date that it started in the United States in March. Um, the total numbers of cases that have been counted by public health, it's about 3.5 million almost. Deaths, 100 and about 137,000. And that there have been about 1,000 cases per 100,000 people that have been counted by the CDC. And you can see that, you know, we had our first wave, but as Dr. Fauci has pointed out, we did not go back down to zero. We didn't finish that first wave before the second wave started. And that is probably because across most of the country, we did not completely control the transmission of the virus. Many places never shut down, never went to mask wearing and distancing and the things we all know we have to do now. Next slide. So last couple of weeks were the cases. This is the part of the country, not New York, where it was before. Where is it going to be when school comes back? We don't know. So. That's very difficult to predict, although we can look at the behaviors and kind of impute that. Next slide. And the, the, in the US, um, as I said before about how the percentage of deaths is higher among those who are older, but the cases are not necessarily um, just among those who are older, that younger populations are circulating the virus. And this is, again, from the recent CDC reports. Next slide. And, um, and this is just from DC, just that, uh, that in particular, the deaths are concentrating among Blacks and Hispanics out of proportion to their share of the population. Next slide. So CDC undertook a zero prevalence survey to see how many of us actually have been infected, and they are still reporting those out. But this is across multiple parts of the country, and I think the important message is in one location after another, on the basis of antibody tests, 11 times more people have been infected than those that CDC had been counting on the basis of their being reported as a case. Next slide. And that's back to a lot of it is probably asymptomatic. And so that makes it hard for us to understand how high the case fatality is. 
So we know about what's reported. And so this is a slide that somebody did that I think is very useful. And I'm sorry, I, I kind of cut it off. The left is Germany, where they did a lot of testing and where even the mild and moderate cases have, were detected. And um, you could just see a higher prevalence but a lower death rate versus the UK where there wasn't much testing and the death rate looked like it was a lot higher simply because they were only counting the more severe cases. Next slide. So college students we know are at risk. Uh, this is an outbreak that happened at University of Texas after a spring break uh, last this year, um, 231 kids, and uh, most of the transmission happened, you know, on spring break. Uh, some of it um, a little bit um, later when they got back on campus. But that being, I think, a lesson for us about about the behavior of young people and how that kind of activity is likely to encourage transmission. Um, and next slide. And. You know, so we, systematic reviews have been done to say what measures actually is there evidence that they work? And this one in particular in the Lancet I thought was useful. Next slide. And what they found is that both social distancing and use of face masks, there's very strong evidence that that is effective. And I think that, you know, it's, it's not just that we're telling people to do these things you know, for moral or ethical reasons, because there certainly aren't moral and ethical reasons to do it, but also because we actually have evidence that this works. And even eye protection may work, although there were fewer studies to actually support that. It wasn't as strong. Next slide. Other issues that we know, outdoor gatherings may be safer, and you know, that governors are trying, have been advised to reopen um, in, in gradual phases and monitor carefully, I, I think we also know that hasn't been done everywhere. Next slide. So we're asked to base our decisions on risk. DC is definitely doing that, where risk is the probability of transmission, but also being able to tamp down on consequences of transmission. Next slide. Um, so you know, since we don't have a vaccine, we do have to manage these risks, meaning that people who are vulnerable need to be more protected, so we have fewer consequences, but we also have to reduce transmission. Those two things are the major things that we can do to um, impact on risk. Next slide. This is the stages that DC has um, to reopening, and um, we are at it. We have a stage two level. Uh, they have very strict gating criteria for when they can go to three. And their criteria has to do with what the virus is doing, but also our capacity in the healthcare system to um, provide care, to provide testing, to provide contact tracing. Next slide. So CDC has not recommended that institutes of higher education conduct testing. But they do say, if you do it, you know, make sure it's acceptable, make sure you deal with the availability of resources, don't just do it once, that's of limited utility. And they kind of put it in a negative sense, but I'll put it in the positive sense, where you have a, cam a campus that has frequent contact and interaction with the surrounding community, I think you're more likely to want to do it, which we certainly do have that. And next slide. And so I, I think we, we understand when, as we reopen activities that there is going to be an uptick in transmission. There is no way we can be as safe as we are with everybody indoors. And I think that's a very important message. On the other hand, we know that there are risks to everybody being indoors. And that's not necessarily the healthiest thing for, it, for most of us and certainly for young people. And that we can exercise great caution to avoid recurrences we can try to reduce transmission within a campus environment to the extent possible. And we certainly don't want our university to be accelerating transmission of COVID within DC. And I think last and not least, but it's certainly in terms of the priorities of this university to take care of the, the safety and care for those who are most vulnerable in our population. And which means that we're providing opportunities for telework and distance education. So thank you very much. Um.
Thank you very much, Dean Coleman. Uh, that was a great start to laying the overarching approach, uh, the public health basis. I hope that uh, all of you are hearing both what we know about this disease, this, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, and also the fact that this is another time where public health has to manage uncertainty. And how do we, as a community, manage that level of uncertainty we will delve? So our next speakers now are going to go in depth into a few aspects. I'm delighted to welcome my colleague, Professor Amanda Castell. Uh, Dr. Castell is a professor in the Department of Epidemiology. She is a core leader of the uh, Center for AIDS Research. She manages just an amazing um, uh, array of studies, including the DC cohort studies on HIV AIDS. And uh, we are very fortunate that she's here to help us understand surveillance and metrics for reopening. So over to you, Amanda. Thanks, Adnan, for the uh, introduction, and thanks everyone for joining. So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about COVID-19 surveillance and talk about some of the metrics that we're seeing observed in the DC metro region, as well as um, for DC specifically, and then as well for the GW campus and what we're proposing. Next slide. So just to start off with, I think as many of you all who are um, in public health know, surveillance really is the backbone for most of our disease uh, control, um, monitoring, and analysis. So it's defined as this ongoing systematic collection of data, which includes also the analysis and interpretation of those data that really are essential to planning, implementation, and the evaluation of our public health practice. <clears throat> and CDC really has been the institution that has led the implementation and funding of most surveillance systems throughout the United States. And they have really been able to rapidly pivot in this, uh, during this pandemic to create new surveillance systems to address COVID-19. And here I've just listed a few, but they really range from looking at um, how much virus is out there. Uh, that includes testing coming from different um, locations and facilities to looking at outpatient and emergency department visits. They do routine monitoring for uh, illnesses that are similar to influenza and also what we call syndromic surveillance. So the idea that if you have, for example, fever, cough, um, that those are some indicators that perhaps there is a respiratory virus circulating. And then last but not least, they also are able to monitor disease severity through these different surveillance programs, including looking at hospitalizations and mortality. And you know, for the sake of time, I didn't show you um, a lot of the data, but there is a very robust uh, website where you can go and look at uh, COVID surveillance tracking on the CDC website. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So, so here's an example of laboratory confirmed associated hospitalizations. And I bring this up because as we all well know, um, there's been quite a bit of challenges in terms of surveillance and who's going to be responsible for specifically healthcare associated and hospitalization surveillance as it relates to COVID-19. Um, the National Healthcare Safety Network is really the foundation and the largest system that tracks healthcare acquired infections in the United States. It's run by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and it has rapidly been modified, as I mentioned, uh, to try to track COVID-19 infections. Next slide. However, we saw earlier this week that um, we are facing some issues and challenges in terms of who should be um, holding on to that data and using those data to make decisions. Um, this is just an excerpt from the guidance that was released on July 10th uh, that basically redirected uh, hospitals to report their information directly to um, the White House and to uh, the federal government versus reporting that information to CDC. Next slide. So locally, we also are seeing the use of COVID-19 surveillance to really help us drive and understand the different phases um, and gateways for reopening in Maryland, DC, and Virginia. And here I've just listed out some of the key metrics that each of those jurisdictions are reviewing in order to determine whether or not they move forward in a particular phase. 
So you can see that there's generally some overlap. Everyone is, of course, interested in um, testing capacity and looking at the number of cases and the percent of the population that's actually testing positive. There's also emphasis at looking at um, ICU beds and hospital bed capacity and making sure that we are not um, going over certain thresholds. And then of course, looking at contact tracing and the ability to be able to quickly uh, identify new cases, their contacts and rapidly contain uh, the virus by putting those individuals into isolation and quarantine. Next slide. So here is just a graph showing you the daily uh, cases of COVID-19 per 100,000 residents in the DC region. Um, you can see District of Columbia, Maryland, Virginia. This is as of yesterday. And you can see that the cases, um, the case rate ranges from about 7.3 or seven cases to almost 11 cases per 100,000. And we are unfortunately starting to see some increases in our area, um, similar to what's being seen in the rest of the United States. Next slide. So as we've been thinking about how to reopen the university and looking at um, different measures and trying to really estimate and anticipate the case prevalence, we've been looking at those types of data where we look at the rate per 100,000 cases. So um, just to show you kind of the thinking behind our approach, on May 27th, the COVID-19 rate in DC was 10.5 cases per 100,000. And that was the day that DC Health decided to reopen and move into phase one. So we're talking about approximately 1.1 cases per 10,000 individuals. There was also an interesting modeling analysis that was done out of Harvard that said that um, perhaps um, jurisdictions would look at a case rate of five cases per 10,000 to be a reopen goal. And so we took those different rates and applied them to our uh, anticipated number of faculty, staff, and students that might return to campus. So overall, there are approximately 30,000 people in our GW community. If we assume that about half of those individuals are going to return to campus um, and you apply those case rates, the DC metric would look that we might have two to three cases at one time on campus. And if you apply the Lipsitch at all, um, uh, case rate, we might have as many as eight cases at one time on campus. And so if you go to the next slide, you can see that once we apply those measures, um, we can quickly see uh, the number of cases on campus that we might anticipate, but also trying to get a sense of what we think the median number of contacts those individuals will have was also really important because we also need to follow up on those individuals. So all the way on the left, you have the threshold of cases per 10,000. Again, that 1.1 is what DC used to move into phase one reopening. The five cases is from the um, article in science. And then we just took different potential thresholds. And you can see here on the second column that the number of cases on campus quickly ramps up from two individuals to as many as 23 uh, persons depending on what that threshold is and then if you look at the number of contacts that those individuals have again you can see that it quickly scales up so next slide so here I've just highlighted that you can see that you know if we get to a point where we do have five cases per 10,000 individuals on campus and those numbers of contacts range from 10 to 20 individuals, we would rapidly have 75 to 150 individuals that we would have to do very aggressive contact casing, contact tracing with. Um, and so again, you can see as the numbers increase that the threshold becomes lower in terms of uh, even having a low number of median contacts. Next slide. So we also, and Dr. Liu will go into this more, have been thinking about the different scenarios around testing and our ability to be able to provide support for COVID-19 on campus. And so we've looked at a variety of um, articles, uh, including some of those that, Dr., uh, that Dean Goldman mentioned, um, and we've looked at those assumptions and what we consider to be the range and what we consider to be perhaps the best case scenario. So I won't go through all of this in detail, but you can see the, you know, the prevalence of seropositivity. Again, some studies have shown that it's as low as 1%, others 
as high as 12%, the best case scenario might be 4%. So we've tried to come up with those different assumptions and how those would impact um, our ability to respond, not only to testing, but to COVID support on campus. Next slide. So if we go back to where we are, um, being obviously a DC-based campus, and we look at where DC is in terms of reopening, this is, these are data from their dashboard metrics, which if you go to coronavirus.dc.gov, you can get a daily update. Um, but you can see that they are looking at about um, six or seven different metrics over time. And I've just pointed out a, a couple here. So, um, as of July 14th, the city had about a 3% positivity. Um, the reproductive, sorry, apologies. The reproductive um, or transmission rate was just over one and the utilization of hospital beds was at 79%. And I can tell you that today um, they're actually at 80%. Uh, the transmission rate is percent and the positivity is up around four percent so they are monitoring these metrics on a regular basis um, and that really drives whether or not they stay in the same phase um, potentially move back or move forward next slide so we have looked at um, all of the metrics that the DC, Maryland, Virginia regions are looking at. We've looked at um, some other guidance that's come out for metrics to consider for colleges and universities as they reopen. And here I've just listed those that we are considering at this point. So first and foremost, of course, we have to follow the local DC uh, health phases and guidelines. Um, uh, secondly, we will of course be looking at testing and again, Dr. Lou will talk a little bit more about our testing approaches, um, but looking at the average testing over um, five days, looking at the testing positivity. We will uh, try to keep our reproductive number for GW uh, down to less than one. And then of course, contact tracing and case investigation is really essential. And so DC Health's ability to be able to conduct those investigations in a timely manner will be key. And our ability to be able to rapidly isolate and quarantine our students will also be important. We will also be uh, looking at syndromic surveillance systems similar to what I showed you that CDC is doing in terms of influenza-like illness, but also want to be able to track indicators such as absenteeism, and also really looking at, you know, what's happening in our community amongst those people who do get infected. Um, you know, are they having mild uh, infections and recovering, or are we seeing more, more um, comorbidity and complications? And then finally, resource availability, of course, looking at our capacity to be able to isolate and quarantine students, and then looking at detection of outbreaks and the characteristics of those outbreaks. So um, are we seeing large clusters of cases? Um, and are these epidemiologically linked cases and clusters that are occurring within our campus, or are they more broadly uh, occurring throughout the DC area? Next slide. So um, that just gives you uh, some ideas about some of the data that we've been looking at to try to inform our approaches. Obviously, we have a lot of things to consider. Um, there are many assumptions and scenarios that are obviously going to be dependent on the local epi, on our ability to test, and of course, on the behaviors that our community engages in. As we think about what metrics we're going to use for reopening and scaling up um, and bringing students back and faculty back, and our testing cadence, we have to think about, you know, what metrics are we going to use internally versus externally, and how detailed do we want the data to be? And then finally, um, I think, you know, an underlying assumption is that all of our public health activities really have to ensure the confidentiality and privacy of our community. So we will not be, you know, showing any data with low numbers of cases that could potentially identify someone. And we will also, you know, not be able to, um, publicly identify dormitories or buildings where cases may be occurring. So with that, I will stop and turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Amanda. This was great. It was a lovely introduction to surveillance and the complexity, actually, of what you've been thinking about. Uh, we will come back to the issue of what definitions are we using? What are the metrics? Who's actually going to collect them? Amanda's just given us a little bit of flavor of the, uh, of the depth of thinking that's gone into it. I'm now delighted to welcome uh, my next colleague, Professor Cindy Liu. Uh, 
Uh, Dr. Liu is a professor in the Environmental and Occupational Health Department. She's also the Chief Medical Officer of the Antibiotic Resistance Center here at GW. And uh, for those of you who know her, Cindy uh, is an amazing um, a microbiologist, pathologist, clinical epidemiologist, and much, much more. So we are very excited that she can talk to us a little bit about how can we detect the COVID-19 virus. So over to you, Cindy. Thank you, Adnan, um, and thank you for the opportunity to um, talk about um, COVID testing. Um, so if we go to the next slide, yes. So um, as Amanda was saying that, um, you know, syndromic uh, monitoring is um, a commonly used method, but something I want to emphasize is the, important, uh, the importance and the utility of using testing in the asymptomatic and presymptomatic population to detect um, those cases as well. Um, and just to highlight um, something that's unique about SARS-CoV-2 um, as compared to the first SARS and influenza virus is that um, you know, in the first uh, SARS, um, the incubation period is similar to SARS-CoV-2. However, um, the peak of infectiousness in the first SARS is actually seven to 10 days after the symptom onset. And you know, as a result, um, SARS-CoV-1, although it has high mortality, it only um, you know, is sort of um, sizzled out after um, a little more than 8,000 cases or so. In contrast, influenza um, is um, more like SARS-CoV-2 because it's much more infectious. Um, and in fact, the peak infectiousness is um, right around the time of symptom onset. And uh, what's really unfortunate about SARS-CoV-2 is the fact that um, the infectiousness of um, those that are infected with SARS-CoV-2 actually peaks um, about two days or so before um, the patient starts to develop symptoms. Next slide. And this is consistent with the studies showing that the viral load is actually at its peak right around the time um, of symptom onset and it actually decreases over the course of infection. And so what this means is that, you know, if we're only testing individuals when they start developing symptoms, they would have been, um, you know, on average walking around for about two days um, at the peak of their infectiousness. Next slide. Um, another um, indicator of the infectiousness of SARS-CoV-2 has to do with um, its binding kinetics. So ACE2 receptor, and that's angiotensin conver converting enzyme 2, ACE2 receptor is the, um, defined you know, as the host receptor for SARS-CoV-2. And, um, um, and so what angiotensin, this ACE2 receptor binds is the receptor binding domain of the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. And what scientists have found is that although if you look at the RNA sequences between SARS-1 and SARS-2, they're rather similar. However, um, the differences is enough so that um, actually they have um, slightly different conformation in the receptor binding domain. And um, when a scientist looked at the binding kinetics of the receptor binding uh, domain protein of uh, SARS-1 and SARS-2, they found that um, the ACE2 receptor affinity to SARS-CoV-2 is about 10 to 20 times higher than to SARS-CoV-1. So another reason why um, SARS-CoV-2 is more infectious. Next slide. Um, and so the ACE2 receptor expression is a, a, a really important factor in how, um, in determining it, an individual's uh, susceptibility to becoming infected by SARS-CoV-2. And um, what I would also like to point out is um, the location um, of ACE2 um, receptor expression. And so what scientists have done is that they looked at um, single cell RNA-seq data from cells that were collected from various parts of the airway. So ranging from 
the upper airway in the nasal cavity to the lower airway all the way down to the lung uh, parenchyma. And so I um, just want to bring your attention to the middle chart here. What it's showing is that actually ACE2 receptor, which um, is maximally expressed actually in the upper airway in the nasal cavity, and it's found primarily in the goblet cells. So these are the cells that produce mucin, um, as well as the ciliated epithelial cells. So it's, it's the infection um, likely starting in the, in the nasal cavity. And this is in contrast to um, other viral infections. Um, and so as compared to the receptors for influenza, um, so that's the, if you look at the right, the table on the right hand side here. Um, so the middle um, a, a chart here is um, showing influenza. Um, it's showing that for instance, the receptors for influenza are expressed in both the upper and the lower airway. Whereas uh, MERS-CoV, that's the one on the most right-hand side, is actually primarily found in the lung parenchyma. And so this is showing, um, this is showing, um, you know, an explanation again for why um, SARS-CoV-2 is more infectious than influenza than, and, and MERS-CoV because of the location of where the viral receptors are. And another um, implication for this finding here in terms of the ACE2 receptor uh, location is the, you know, when you're, when we are selecting uh, which type of specimen to use for COVID-19 testing. So next slide. Um, and Lynn started to touch on this a little bit, but um, just to recap, um, there are at right now, three main kinds of COVID-19 assays or tests. Um, the two types of tests that detect the virus directly includes um, the SARS-CoV-2 antigen assay. Um, and so this is basically an assay that's detecting a viral protein. Um, the other type of um, SARS-CoV-2 assay are the ones that would detect the nucleic acid, so the viral RNA, um, and uh, that can be done through a PCR or a isothermal a nucleic acid assays. Um, lastly, so the third type of assay, and that's really different than the other two, is looking for antibodies that uh, recognize that uh, binds to uh, SARS-CoV-2. So that is basically a test that you would um, uh, use um, for uh, using a, a blood specimens. And I'll talk just, and for, I think for the purpose of the rest of this talk, we're really going to focus on testing of, um, look, of direct detection of the virus. Next slide. So I want to take a few minutes and talk about um, you know, what are the factors that um, can affect the sensitivity and specificity of um, assays that detect um, SARS-CoV-2 virus? Um, the three things I want to focus on are the assay limit of detection, the type of specimen that you test, um, but also the clinical course, which is highly important. Um, but there are many other things that can affect the sensitivity and specificity of your test. Um, and that has to do with how well, um, you know, the sample is collected. Um, and, um, and, you know, uh, a, sorry. So, uh, you know, a swab test is really, um, it's really affected, I think, by how, how you know, thorough or correctly the, the swabbing is done. So the sampling sufficiency is really important. Um, other things such as you know, cross-contamination that's happening in the laboratory or uh, how well the specimen is stored after collection and so on and so forth can be really important as well. Uh, last but not least, you know, um, the differences between individuals in terms of the amount of virus the person is shedding, where they're shedding the virus and so on and so forth is highly important. Next slide. So the first thing I wanted to talk about um, is the, the importance of the limit of detection. And the limit of detection 
can be highly variable depending on the type of assay that you use. Um, and so um, I, I just point out sort of three main assay format here. Um, so um, in terms of assays that detect the viral nucleic acid, the viral RNA that can be either a PCR assay or um, an isothermal uh, a nucleic acid assay, um, amplification assay. So the PCR assay here is the most sensitive. Um, and there, I made a slight typo there. So it's the, but it, it, te it tends to take a longer time. So it, 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 the sort of the fastest PCR assay that we have is actually 60 minutes. So it's 60 minutes or more. Um, but it's highly sensitive. Um, and an isothermal nucleic amplification assay um, is less than exponential. Um, and, and what, what um, um, and so, but it's extremely quick because you don't have to go through the sort of heating up and cooling of the, the, the regular PCR, which is what takes up um, so much more time. And therefore, an isothermal nucleic acid is, is um, I think, uh, uh, really suitable for a point of care test and can give you results in less than 15 minutes. And this is the, the Abbott uh, ID now assay. However, the, the limit of detection is um, going to be um, uh, less optimal. And I'm gonna show you some data about that in a second. Um, last but not least, the antigen assay, which is also another, um, uh, a very rapid assay, um, but it's actually, because there's no amplification associated uh, with this uh, detection method, it has the um, theoretically the highest um, limit of detection. So it's basically going to miss cases where viral load is low, um, but it's relatively rapid. Um, and so there's one antigen assay that I'm aware of that is FDA approved, that is currently available, and it's a sandwich assay um, a fluorescent sandwich assay that is works a lot like basically like a pregnancy test, um, but you do have to uh, you have a reader to read um, this uh, antigen assay because to to capture the fluorescent signal. So next, so here is just um, some results to show you the, the difference in the limit of detection between a regular PCR assay and an isothermal assay and um, the implication of the difference in the limit of detection. Um, so here are um, basically results from three different assays. Um, the COBUS and the EXPERT are both um, regular PCR assays, whereas the ID now is the isothermal assay. Uh, which can potentially, it, it can give you a, a, if it's positive, can result in, you know, five minutes or less, apparently. Um, but what you can see here that I've highlighted for you is that, um, so basically here what the results are showing is going from high viral load to the left to low viral load to the right. And so what you can see here is that um, although the positive, the, the agreement is, is, rather good when the viral load is high in individuals who are actively infected by SARS-CoV-2. If the viral load is low, they are missed um, by the ID now assay. Um, and based on this, um, so the ID now assay, um, uh, you know, the limit of detection is, is sort of hundredfold difference. So next slide. So um, when you're, um, I think that something is um, really important, but there is not yet, I think, uh, a consensus uh, on is the type of specimen that is uh, collected for testing. Um, so in terms of viral testing, the specimens that can be collected include those from the upper airway, the upper respiratory tract, and also from the lower respiratory tract. Um, and the upper respiratory tract specimens can include a sort of the classic, sort of the gold standard nasal pharyngeal swab. And so the nasopharynx is really sort of all the way back behind your nasal cavity 
Um, and I know people who have gone through it sometimes feels like the swab is touching their brain. I mean, it goes really deep back in there. So, but here is an image showing, um, you know, where the swab is actually supposed to um, uh, uh, collect specimen from when a nasal pharyngeal swab is, is being collected. So it's a, it's a rather uh, uncomfortable procedure. And so um, there are now additional specimen types that are used uh, for upper respiratory tract that includes uh, a mid-turbinate swab. So basically the back of the nasal cavity, so that's a deep nasal swab, and the anterior nasal um, uh, specimen is also used now. Um, and in the lower respiratory tract, um, some of the commonly used method um, is for saliva um, and sputum and bronchial alveolar lavage. And so um, in terms of um, specimen types, what's really important is the uh, ability to use self-collected specimens. So I've highlighted here for you that these are the specimen types that can be self-collected, which is really important because that reduces the, the use of um, PPE and protects the, the safety of, of the staff collecting samples. Um, so next slide. So I know that there is a lot of interest in saliva as a specimen type. There are a lot of reasons why it's attractive. Um, for instance, this is the one specimen type that does not, um, well, one of the major easily collected specimen type that does not require a swab. Uh, it's also really easy um, for self-collection. Um, it's a lot easier to tell um, uh, individuals to spit in you know, a container than to um, do a, a swabbing. Um, and also um, saliva specimens, um, you know, it's less susceptible to uh, collecting insufficient amount of sample. However, there are also limitations associated with saliva specimen that needs to be taken into consideration. So one of the um, limitation is the fact that saliva tends to have, um, you know, variable uh, variability uh, in, in viscosity and it can be highly viscous. And so what that means is that requires um, adding some uh, solution in the processing step, which can actually dilute the specimen and affect the limit of detection. Um, also, as I mentioned before, the ACE2 receptor is predominantly expressed in the upper, upper airway. So, you know, the implication of using saliva for early detection uh, I think is still something that's uh, needed to be better understood. Um, and then um, on the FDA side, saliva is actually treated as a, a distinct specimen from all the other upper respiratory tract specimens, which are sort of broadly equivalent. Um, so you actually require additional FDA approval to analyze saliva as a specimen type. Next slide. Oh, so click again. Okay, so I wanted to just take a few minutes here and just talk about, you know, the importance of the time point in the infection course. How does that affect sensitivity and specificity? So basically how well your assay works is not only based on the assay that you select, but it's really dependent on the amount of virus that is, that is shed by the individual. It's, it's also really important, you know, affected by the, where you're sampling in the person. And so this graph here, it's a little bit busy, but what is showing is the time course starting from exposure, which is uh, a week prior to symptom onset, all the way to week six, it's showing basically that the viral load in the nasal pharyngeal swab um, and um, uh, lower respiratory tract peaks, you know, right as the symptom uh, it, it, onset and decreases over time and also showing that um, virus is shed in the GI tract as well. Um, so what this is showing here is that, so the sensitivity and specificity of your test for a given individual really depends on when you test that person. Next slide. Okay, sorry, okay. Um, and um, even though, you know, as I was saying before, um, uh, detecting, trying to manage, um, uh, trying to do test and, and contact tracing uh, 
uh, sorry, trying to manage, uh, uh, you know, the infection detection by symptom is, is really challenging for SARS-CoV-2. However, um, symptom-based management um, for um, uh, 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 basically cl clearing somebody from self-isolation is actually um, it is recommended. There's a protocol recommended by the CDC. And so I'll explain, you know, how, how that sort of works here. Um, and so as per the, the CDC recommendation, um, the self-isolation period is approximately 10 days after the symptom onset. And um, right now, um, it is not required to, for the individual to have a negative test before they um, can leave isolation as long as they are asymptomatic. Um, and one of the reasons for that, as you can see right here, actually, is that um, with the red line showing that actually um, uh, uh, replication competent virus are rarely isolated um, after about eight days or so after symptom onset. Next slide. And so here's just another view of that. Um, so these are data from the CDC website. Um, what this is showing is that, you know, um, so on the, uh, the figure on the left-hand side. So after a certain number of um, uh, days of symptom onset and starting at day eight, after day eight, um, you know, scientists have not been able to actually recover replication competent virus from patients. Um, and so um, this is why, you know, that 10 day recommendation is used. Um, on the right hand side, what it's showing is also, in fact, the ability to recover live virus, replication competent virus um, from clinical specimens is also tied to the amount of virus um, that is in the specimen, the viral load. Um, and so what this is showing here um, is that, you know, although there is not a strict cutoff that can be used, on average, um, you know, there's much less success in recovering um, replication competent virus when the viral load is low. Next slide, sorry. So last thing I wanna to touch on using um, this um, uh, disease progression graph is actually to talk about how we, our strategy for detecting pre-symptomatic cases. And so, um, as you can, uh, as I, you know, based on everything that I've explained, um, you know, individuals are maximally infectious two days before symptom onset, um, and the incubation period is about five days. And so ideally, what we would want to do is to test individuals five days um, after they have been exposed. And so, um, and also there is the possibility of um, actually you know, having a false negative test when you're testing somebody at an early stage, sort of immediately after their exposure at early time points of their, or their infection. And so therefore, um, really the best way um, to um, detect all, to detect the pre-symptomatic cases is to do two sequential PCR tests um, that are approximately five days apart. And so this, makes you uh, less likely to miss somebody because they're early in their infection. And the second thing is that for those individuals that have documented high-risk exposure, um, you know, if you test them right away, you're not gonna really be able to see anything. However, um, the best way is to um, test them uh, approximately five days, I mean, three to five days um, after exposure. And that is what, um, we will be doing as part of the, the reopening campus testing. Next slide. Um, and so here's my one slide about using antibody uh, testing uh, uh, for um, assessing um, uh, uh, individuals' exposure, um, history of exposure to SARS-CoV-2. And so, SARS, so antibody tests um, basically is not, uh, individuals are going to develop antibodies at different time points after their symptom onset. However, what we know right now is that after about 10 days after symptom onset, um, 
nearly all, like universally, individuals start to make antibodies. Um, however, in SARS-CoV-2, what is interesting is that, you know, individuals actually start developing IgG, IgM, anti-SARS-CoV-2, IgG, and IgM usually around the same time. And so, um, uh, really, that, so, however, because of the timing of um, the development of anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibody, that it is so late in infection, it really is not a, a good test for clinical management purposes. Um, this is a test that, you know, allows us to um, assess, um, you know, the level of, of exposure in our community. And so this is a test that, um, that we are looking at incorporating into the recampus, uh, reopening campus uh, testing, um, but, but not at the regular, uh, not at the type of regular interval as we would use the viral PCR test. Next slide. And so this is just a, a brief a summary of the different types of antibody tests. Um, you know, there are also um, these uh, lateral flow tests, like a pregnancy test that can be used to measure antibodies that are really in, inexpensive. Uh, however, the throughput is low. On the right-hand side, you have these really large instruments, core lab instruments um, that can uh, do many tests, but they're um, more expensive. Um, so uh, if, uh, and when we uh, do antibody tests um, for, as part of the campus reopening plan, um, we will be using um, a, more of a, a research and a core lab test that is a, a regular ELISA test. Next. Okay, so um, now I'll just, um, you know, have a, a, my last few slides will actually be the specifics about the campus reopening planning. And, you know, so we have our students come back. Next slide. But, you know, there's a lot, oops, there's a lot we have to do. If this is what the campus looks like when the students come back, you know, no amount of testing or contact tracing is going to, um, uh, control the spread. So this is my joke slide. So the next slide. <laughs> so the type of testing that we are um, incorporating into the re, uh, campus reopening strategy are three kinds of viral PCR tests. We have those that we are certainly going to test those that develop symptoms um, within 24 hours of the symptoms being reported. And they're also going to be prompted to make um, an appointment for a telehealth visit. We're going to be testing those with high risk exposure. Uh, we're going to be also testing um, uh, those that are asymptomatic uh, as part of surveillance testing. And I mentioned that we are going to implement two consecutive tests right in the beginning of campus opening to make sure that we do pick up all the uh, asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic cases. Um, and we're going to have um, actually regular testing thereafter also of the rest of the campus. And the turnaround time for the viral PCR test is going to be next day. And also want to point out that those, uh, we're going to have separate testing sites for those uh, who have symptoms and, and also uh, from the, the surveillance testing. Sorry, they're going to be going to two different places. Next slide. So as you can imagine, um, this is a really big uh, testing effort. So there is a lot of emphasis put on, placed on the throughput of the testing. So our goal is to conduct, um, our search capacity is 7,500 PCR tests per day. In order to meet that goal, there are a couple of um, approaches that we have taken. Um, so that includes automation, um, the use of these mini pools, as well as um, a, a really um, customized laboratory information management system. Um, so all that, all these different approaches combined is what's going to allow us to meet the surge capacity that's needed. Next slide. Um, and um, here's just a, a very, very high level and brief overview of um, how the laboratory will be handing off um, you know, the, the test results that we have. Essentially, we have our own uh, limb system, as I mentioned, and the results are going to be uploaded into another system called point and click. 
and point, -click, point and click will have two functions. One is that it can serve, it will serve as an electronic health record system, but it's also going to have a, a sort of separate COVID module that is going to be used by the campus COVID support team, the CCST, um, to um, report results to occupational health, to student health, and uh, university notif uh, a notified, a notification. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Cindy. Really appreciate the detailed analysis of the of the technology <laughs> and as well the the uh, important message you're giving about uh, potential false negative results. So we'll come back to that uh, hopefully in the Q and A. Moving very quickly on to our next uh, speaker, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Professor Amida Vyas, who's a professor in the Department of Popul uh, Prevention and Community Health. Um, uh, Dr. Vyas is actually director of our a brand new uh, research center in maternal, neonatal, and child health. She's also editor of uh, one of the journals here at GW and comes with great exp experience, not only in community engagement and looking at reproductive health and adolescent health, but also in uh, evaluation and research methods. So Amita, over to you for talking to us a little bit about information and technology. Sure, thank you so much. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanna take a few minutes today to share some of the data and technology challenges public health agencies have been facing since the start of this epidemic and how critical data systems are to mitigation and prevention efforts on our own campus. So all of the public health and science-based strategies that we're gonna be putting into place here at GW, physical distancing, face coverings, testing, tracing, surveillance, it must be supported by integrated data systems and technology that works in a way that's consistent with how this coronavirus behaves. So what do I mean by that? Well, we, as Dr. Liu pointed out, it is critical to identify individuals who are positive early in the disease progression, right? We know that symptoms typically appear within four or five days after exposure. And in fact, people spread the virus during the 48 hours before they start experiencing symptoms. So if we don't have the right data systems in place to rapidly identify cases and close contacts in a 48 hour period, the virus wins the race. So what does that mean from a practical standpoint? So let's assume as we will have here on the GW campus that testing is widely available. Well, that data, a positive test result, needs to flow from a lab back to a provider to the individual, as well as to the local health department. And that happens no matter where you are um, in the country. And then a case investigation needs to occur, which is an in-depth interview with that positive case, which also includes eliciting and identifying close contacts. All of that, which leads to care for that positive case, ensuring that that positive case is isolated, assuring that close contacts are tested and quarantined, and all of that needs to happen within 48 hours or even sooner to stop further spread of the virus. It can only happen if the data flows efficiently and quickly. And we're talking about hundreds or thousands of cases in cities and counties and in states. So the smallest bottleneck in the way that the data flows can lead to an outbreak that exponentially grows and it's unable to contain. The other important component of this is that without integrated and again, rapid data systems, we can't make data-driven decisions. We know that data secrecy, as uh, Dr. Castell pointed out, it cripples our public health efforts to slow the spread of COVID-19. And given how important individual responsibility and an individual's behavior is to containing the spread, if people, if we as individuals don't have accurate real-time information about outbreaks, hotspots, places where cases are surging, we can't protect ourselves, our families, and our communities. Next slide, please. So amidst the public health heroes who are working in our public health departments and agencies and who are truly on the front lines of fighting this virus, it is very clear that the capacity barriers that they faced early in the pandemic continue to exist today. Um, I think we all know that for months and years to come, people will weigh in on how COVID-19 quickly created complete chaos and turned this country upside down. And no doubt that a central component to that was the underinvestment in our public health infrastructure. We have left our public health agencies without sort of the minimum standard of public health foundation capabilities, including 21st century data systems and technology. 
you know, public health officials and private labs have managed to expand testing, but without a real technology system that can smoothly handle that avalanche of results, we won't be able to really mitigate and contain the virus. So in many health departments, there is smooth electronic reporting of cases, but in many, test results arrive via phone, email, physical mail, and my favorite, the fax machine, which I know more recently we've heard a lot more about in public health departments with fax machines overloaded, with papers flying all over the place. Um, and then often these reports are you know, duplicated or they've gone to the wrong health department or they're missing crucial information, such as a patient's phone number or address. So early on in the pandemic, I had the privilege with many of my colleagues here at the school to volunteer with several of our local health agencies. Um, and I worked alongside some of the most dedicated and hardworking public health workers in those agencies. But it was emotionally and it, exhausting and at times disheartening to feel, you know, am I really making a difference here? Right? So for me personally, I spent sleepless nights thinking about the countless number of people who I had to call for case investigations and contact tracing, who by the time I got to their lab result from a very large pile of papers and faxes, and by the time I made that phone call, not only days, but sometimes weeks after they had been tested or fallen ill, they had passed away. You know, to call someone to see how they're doing and elicit information about their symptoms, exposures, and contacts, and to hear their child or spouse tell you that they've already passed away, it's heartbreaking. And it leaves a person really feeling helpless against this virus. It was clear early on, and it continues to be in many places around the country, that the virus is outpacing our technology and the piles of paper are growing every day. Next slide, please. On the other hand, right, in our efforts to really want to do something uh, to end the virus, to reopen the economy, our country's tech titans propose lots of new technology solutions, uh, many using smartphones and largely focused on contact tracing. You know, we all know that traditional contact tracing is labor intensive, so I think many of us really hope to see innovative solutions. But today, it's not very clear that these solutions have really demonstrated that they can do what is needed and do it in a reliable, private uh, manner. So let's take the one that everybody's talking about and that's the Apple and Google API. So they teamed up and they created an exposure notification API. And if you look on the settings uh, on your own iPhones, if you have one, you'll see that that API is likely already installed in there if you've got the latest software. So what does it do? It warns participants if their phone has been near the phone of a person who's reported being uh, positive for COVID-19. So that sounds great, right? The idea sounds great, putting the power of exposure notification into our own hands. But it's unclear whether these apps are actually science-based, right? Do they account for the risks associated with exposure? So for example, false positives. You know, we all have fleeting interactions with people, whether it's walking by someone at the grocery store or here on campus, we'll be walking by lots of different people. Again, fleeting moments. If the app flags these sort of lower risk encounters, right, it'll cast a wide net when reporting exposure. Um, and because most exposures flagged by the app will not lead to infection, many users will be instructed to test and self quarantine even though they're unlikely to develop the infection. So a person might put up with this a few times, but after a few false alarms, it's quite likely that people will start ignoring the app. Um, it also is an issue that the app cannot account for uh, PPE, right? So whether or not you are exposed to somebody or you're with somebody for a period of time and whether or not you're wearing masks. I also think it's especially, uh, this is an especially important consideration when it comes to campuses. As I said earlier, we are encountering you know, lots of people, one another, in fleeting moments. We also know that smartphone penetration in the US remains at about 81%, so it's likely that the, those who are most at risk and probably most vulnerable, as Dean Goldman shared earlier in the presentation, they're unlikely to have a smartphone or to use an app. Uh, next slide, please. So based on our experiences working with health departments, reviewing contact tracing apps, for our GW reopening efforts, we've proposed a technology and data system approach for testing, tracing, and surveillance that's based on some key factors. One, partnerships. 
Um, we need to ensure that our data systems flow uh, between the lab, so Dr. Liu's lab, through what Dr. Liu had shared with you, the CCST, the Campus COVID Support Team, our new Occupational Health Center for employees, and the Student Health Center. We need a data system that's integrated between all of these entities within the university to effectively protect the safety of everyone on our campus. We also need to ensure that we're doing this with real data privacy and confidentiality and that we're very careful about how information is shared and to whom that information is shared with. And again, going back to what I shared earlier, we need to assure that these are rapid data systems. We want to win the race against this virus, which means we need to rapidly test, trace, and isolate. Next slide, please. And finally, even though we don't need uh, perhaps the Apple Google API uh, in terms of location tracking and exposure notification, we do believe and we have proposed um, an integrated and interactive consumer facing mobile app for information sharing and notification. You know, we need an app that's going to allow us to efficiently communicate with everyone on campus and to provide all of us on campus the tools we need in one place. Um, and we need to make sure that that communication is uh, bi-directional. I believe this is especially important if we want to send public health communications, cues to action, interventions that are aimed at supporting healthy social norms uh, to, spread, uh, to prevent the spread of the virus. Um, and on that note, I'm going to um, leave this to Dr. Karen McDonald, my colleague, who's going to talk more about that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amita. Thank you for bringing in uh, the perspective of technology as well as uh, very critical ethics elements that you spoke about. I'm now delighted to uh, introduce our final speaker, uh, Professor Karen McDonald. Uh, Dr. McDonald is a professor in the Department of Prevention and uh, Community Health as well. She has uh, a ton of expertise in looking at evaluation, implementation, looking at behavior change and, and community engagement, and very importantly has served on, on the Faculty Senate and another um, uh, leading bodies of GW. I'm excited that she'll talk to uh, us a little bit about what we can do to spread uh, the spread of the virus here at uh, GW. Over to you, Karen. Thanks, Adnan. I'm doing it right now. I'll take that off for now. Okay, so next slide, we're going to talk about reducing the spread. What can you do at GWU? So, you know, as we've heard, we don't have a cure, we don't have a vaccine, but what we do have is prevention. And those are right now in the area of behavior change. So that's on the part of each of us as individuals to make that change. Um, and as you can see here, who would have thought in 2020, we are trying to get people to wash their hands correctly and effectively. Um, to cover your cough and your sneeze, to wear a cloth face cover, and to keep a physical distance of six feet of space between you and your friends. Next slide. So, how do we go, how did we get in some ways to where we are today. So we're seeing the politicization of these behaviors and that's really concerning to us in public health. So as you see on the left, we have people fighting for their personal freedoms to not engage in the prevention efforts that we need for COVID. And we know that political beliefs, our community um, and our level of trust can influence our behaviors in public health. And we know that as Go uh, Dean Goldman has presented that the coronavirus doesn't care how we vote. It only cares how we can get into our bodies. And this is where prevention behaviors come in and are so important as they are really what we can do right now to prevent the transmission of coronavirus. So we are trying to get from people not wearing face coverings as you see on the left to those on the right. So what we can do is maybe look at why. So the symptom of something as to why they're not wearing a face covering, because we know that behavior change isn't easy. If it were, many of us would have nothing to do. So let's look at the science behind behavior change and see what we can do. Next slide. So for those of us, and thank you for, I see a number of people from the Department of Prevention and Community Health on the participant list. Um, we know there's a lot that goes into creating sustained behavior change. 
So uh, like I said, for many of us, this is our life's work, but here's a couple of things that we need to pay attention to when we wanna change how we engage in doing something that's new uh, in our world. And these are things that we need to be thinking about as we look toward reopening uh, GW. So most importantly, people need to know what they need to do. That's where messaging is so important and has failed us in the beginning as we were dealing with this pandemic. For, for many, let's take social distancing. That was really hard to understand. What does that mean? And because in times of stress, we look to the comfort of others. Um, sometimes we need a hug or a handshake. And now you're saying that we can't. Because for so many people, the word social also means emotional and comfort. So by using that word social distancing, we've already created fear and discomfort in people. And so that we do know that people want to take action, but they have to know what actions to take and why they're taking them. So like we've done today, education and information are powerful tools and they help to increase our knowledge. What is the behavior? Why are we doing it? And then it helps to enhance our attitudes about taking preventative action. And we've had to do this with a few things, but one in particular is that in order to get people to engage with messages, such as to wear a mask, we actually now have to start calling it, calling it a face covering because the word mask has been so politicized that we, we have to really shy away from using that, but now we've gone to saying the word face covering, which doesn't sort of necessarily lead itself to um, sort of pithy sayings such as no mask, no class. Um, so if you guys can think of some that incorporate face covering, please put them in the chat box. Um, we also have to demonstrate that the choice to act far outweighs the cons. We need to model these behaviors by leaders and those around us to change our social norms about wearing a face covering. And we can do this. And this is where self-efficacy comes in, is we need to have masks available. We need to practice wearing a mask before we go out and back onto GW campus. The first time you do a new behavior, is it's always hard. Okay, so practice wearing the mask before we get back onto campus. Practice talking, asking questions, uh, conversing with one another. Um, having encouragement and positive feedback will also help us to continue with these new behaviors. And I have to say that as somebody who has been in this world of behavior change and social norms, it's been really encouraging actually to see how quickly that we as a society have um, embraced wearing face coverings. Typically, when we're talking about changing social normative behavior, such as not smoking in public or wearing a seatbelt, these have taken years for people to bring into their sort of everyday. So I actually have a lot of hope that wearing a face covering, uh, we can all do. I've seen it, I've seen it happening now, the, the issue is we need to sustain that behavior change. Next slide. And so rather than what I said in the beginning of what can you do at GW, now it's what can we do at GW? Because with any kind of behavior change, even though we think of it as something that the individual does, it's actually influenced by our environment and we are that environment at GW. And we can learn from not only what we're dealing with with COVID, but a lot of us have experience in dealing with other public health issues, such as we have seen firsthand with COVID that mixed messaging actually creates chaos. So that we need clear, consistent messaging. We also need to communicate clear expectations for what it takes to create a safe or safer environment. We need responsible leadership. And, and especially at GW to convey these messages. Um, there's, you know, there's been one study that came out that found that directly after the Surgeon General put out the recommendation to wear masks, they found a statistically significant increase in reported mask wearing of 12 percentage points within a week and mask buying of over seven percentage points. 
So these findings indicate the speed with which when we have clear government recommendations can affect the population of protective behaviors by those in the public. And these results demonstrate the importance of having cohesive national leadership in communication during a public health crisis. And this is something that we can do at GW amongst our own community. And so with that, we need to model these positive behaviors. We need to change the acceptability of wearing a mask or a face covering or how we greet one another. Um, it is hard not to sometimes run up to people. We know that when we get our undergrads and graduate students back together, we haven't seen each other. You wanna hug each other. Well, let's think of other ways that, that we can show each other that we care about each other. Um, and having encouragement, um, such as uh, making sure we have signage that is up so we can keep rem reminding people to take preventative behaviors. Uh, maybe we have a uh, face covering challenge. Maybe you can see here with the, the pictures I have listed, maybe we have a who wore it best or uh, who can design the best face covering for GW for when we go back on campus. And we have to think about not just what we can't do, but what we get to do by being together at GW when we reopen. Um, put it in the positive, so we get to, we can do. So let's think about, as a GW community, what we can do. So that brings us to the next slide. We get to work together to create a safer environment. Um, we are working together, as you'll see when we come back on campus, to have physical changes that will facilitate behavior change. Uh, there will be markers on the floors about what is six feet. We have changed classrooms, so you don't have to know how far away to sit from somebody, but actually taking out the desks. Um, we're also, as you saw uh, with Dr. Liu, we're gonna have regular coronavirus testing on site at GW. We are establishing the Campus COVID Support Team or the CCST. And we're also working in collaboration with the DC Department of Health and their efforts. Next slide. Um, this is a schematic just to give you an idea of what this means for you at GW about testing um, on campus. While this schematic does say for students, it also pertains to uh, staff and faculty as well. So what we're seeing is that we are asking students to quarantine when they get to GW or if they're non-residential prior to getting to GW um, and that they will register and have that test. And while that test is being processed, you just saw that with Dr. Liu, what they'll be doing, that the results will then be conveyed confidentially within a push notification to a, secure, to a secure website for you to get your results. And if you do have a positive test, you will be contacted by the CCST. Um, either you contact them or, or they will contact you and that the student and or the faculty staff member will then begin an isolation protocol. And they are putting a dorm offline uh, for isolation and quarantine. And then within 24 hours, the DC Department of Health will be contacting you as part of their requirements uh, with the coronavirus. Um, but then the, the, for a student, the uh, Colonial Health will be contacting you, but if it's staff and faculty, it'll be Occupational Health will be contacting you. Uh, to uh, go through the isolation protocol and then, of course, the clearance that Dr. Liu talked about. However, if you um, do, it, for those having a negative test, we are also asking that you uh, engage in a symptom tracking and that that tracking system will then put a push notification if you have certain symptoms that uh, are part of the algorithm to then uh, get a uh, coronavirus test, um, but we're asking that that be done on a daily basis. And this just gives you just a broad overview of how some of the thinking is behind the, uh, the testing protocols for GW, but that's also in conjunction with these other preventative efforts that we've been talking about. And then the last slide is, let's say that, that somebody does test positive at the GW campus, and when they do come in con when they do get interviewed, 
they um, give you or your class or a close contact of your name. And so what contact tracing will look like in from the Centers for Disease Control, uh, which will be similar to what is currently uh, being proposed at GW, is that we will have a team of contact tracing support that will work in collaboration with the DC Department of Health, whereby trained contact tracers um, will be in contact with those who the positive person has identified. And they will be followed up with to see if that person has symptoms and to um, offer a COVID test so that they too will know what their, um, if they're uh, COVID positive and that they will begin a self quarantining for 14 days. And this is all gonna be tracked within the point and click system that has already been incorporated on the GW campus. For our students, it will now incorporate our faculty and staff as well. So all of this to say is that there are multiple different preventative actions being taken at the GW campus, whether it is the testing and tracing, or it is the changing the physical environment of GW. But remember, this is we are all in this together and that there are things that we need to be doing to ensure that we decrease the transmission of coronavirus at the GW campus. And with that, I will end and leave it open for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Karen. Thank you for bringing the, the, the important community and human perspective. So ladies and gentlemen, we have now spent uh, over an hour describing to you the, the true scientific and public health basis of the COVID response. Uh, from the overall perspective that uh, the Dean presented into data and surveillance, the antibody testing programs, the use of technology, contact tracing, and indeed social norm changes. Um, I have counted over 35 questions and comments that have come on the chat board. So it's going to be an enormous task, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to try and use our time effectively to address as many as we can. But what we promise to do is to use those questions to develop a document and answer them and respond to them and put them up together with a copy of the slides on our website that my colleague Stacy has already put the uh, website link as well. We'll put it right there. So those of you, and I, what I'm going to do is to try and combine a few questions. So I wanna start with Dean Goldman first. Dean Goldman, there are questions around the fact, and I'll, I'll give you two questions to respond to. One, around the uncertainty of the disease and children. If the cases are increasing in a population which is under 35, then how can we be so confident that uh, exposing them to a different environment is truly protective? And the second one, which is separate, is around graduate research assessments. There seem to be a specific question uh, asking us whether GRAs in the GW community are being considered in the, in the reopening plans. Well, first and foremost, I just want to thank the, all the people who have stuck with us through this seminar. It's an amazing uh, turnout, and I love the comments in the chat box because they mirror a lot of the discussions we've been having endlessly over the last few weeks about, you know, trying, you know, how can we do this perfectly and the constant shifts in our knowledge about the virus, which then cause us to change, you know, our plans. And, and um, there's no handbook of COVID-19. Uh, so that's the challenge that we face. You know, um, in terms of children, um, well, I, I think, you know, pediatric populations uh, really change a lot, you know, over time. So, you know, in a sense, uh, really, I would, I would broaden that to children and also younger adults, because I think there's an evolution of behavior and development that happens, and that seems to be reflected in what's happening with the virus. Now, first and foremost, when we're talking about younger adults, like our students, I think it would be pretty presumptuous of us to say that, you know, their behavior is going to be totally dependent on whether they come back to our campus or not. I happen to be the mother of one of those people. She is constantly in touch with an entire world full of people through um, her phone that um, either people she has met or has not met or people she might want to meet. And kids are like that and they'll go out and meet them. And so the fact that they might gather together on a campus, it's not the only place they might gather together. I think all of you recognize that. Um, so I think that the, the challenge though is that there's been, I think, a 
a misunderstanding about risk and that the message has come across that younger people have low risk and some of them have taken that to mean no risk. And that is very dangerous because of course there is some risk and, and the data very strongly point to that. And so how to, and as, as Karen said, you know, communicating that is very difficult. It's much, it's much easier to say it's green light, red light, and it's very hard to communicate about things that are in between. And um, so nobody is saying, you know, that by uh, people leaving their homes, they aren't going to be at more risk. I said that before, I'm going to say it again. You leave your house and you have connectivity with other people, masks or no masks, your risk goes up a little bit. I, you know, the, 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 the question is one of how much and how, and the evidence that we have about the physical distancing and mask wearing very much lowering our risk should provide us you know, with assurance about being, for most of us, safe enough, but not all of us. Some of us may have underlying health conditions and other issues that would make us feel that we have to be safer than that. And others of us, by the way, not being able to go out means that we have food insufficiency, maybe losing our homes, may not be able to um, maintain our, our the, you know, food sufficiency for our children. So I think that we're all in a, in a different boat that way, but that societally it is very difficult to indefinitely have everybody be under lockdown forever. And so, you know, we, ha I think, have to learn how to kind of dance with this virus in a way that's safe enough for us, you know, but if we're banging the pots and pans and we wake it up, um, we don't know how to control it once it's mad at us, you know, and it's wide awake. And so, you know, it is, there is no ability to have kind of a green light to life as normal until we have a vaccine. That's a problem. And any specific comment on the GRA, uh, Dr. Goldman? Well, the GRAs uh, and, and our thinking have, we've been thinking about them as we think about the faculty. And we've actually been thinking in terms of, you know, the faculty who are in the classroom face to face with undergraduates, maybe at a higher risk than those who are in the classroom face to face just with grad students. And that certainly those who, GRAs who like professors are just teaching online are kind of, and never come to campus, would be in that, in that risk group. And so, you know, whether you're on campus or not, and who you are with um, makes a difference. Uh, I think that we can't calculate exactly what the risks differential is, Thank but you. we're pretty sure it does. Thank you. It's important to know that uh, all our population is part of our plan. Amanda, two questions for you. One, a critical question where Folks are asking, if you are applying models, then it, wouldn't it be true that you could model the number of deaths that may happen at GW if opening was to happen? Could you respond to that a little bit? And the second question that I think is a, a sort of a fun question is, how do we trust data now that CDC is no longer responsible and that the uh, COVID uh, data is going to, let's just say, a, an administrative office uh, as opposed to CDC? Would you have reflections on both of those, your models and CDC data? Yeah, I'll start with the, the last question. Um, so I do want to reemphasize that what I showed you is just the hospitalization data. That has That is what has been mandated now to be circumvented from the CDC to this new data warehouse um, at the White House. So um, the state and local health departments continue to do their routine surveillance for all diseases, but obviously for COVID-19 as well. And so they really do currently remain, um, you know, kind of the, the gatherers and, and keepers of that really important information that they need at the local level in order to be able to make these decisions and to plan effectively. So, um, you know, I just urge everyone um, to, you know, have faith in a system um, that's been working for years. The CDC, um, you know, workers and, and the, the researchers there and the scientists there are really sound and um, really know what they're doing. And it's just unfortunate that we are seeing this diversion of key and critical information. Um, your second question was about deaths. So um, we 
So I've looked at the numbers of deaths in DC um, and in the Maryland region. The death rate ranges from about 0.1 to 0.4 cases per 100,000. So it's relatively low, um, but they are, there are deaths. And so it will be a little bit, we haven't really looked at it specifically amongst the GW community. It's something that we could do. However, um, you know, we don't, at least right now, have access to the really granular data that we would need about age distribution, risk factors, race, ethnicity, et cetera, to be able to really make um, a meaningful um, estimate of you know, the potential for death um, or for severe comorbidity from COVID amongst our community. But it's a great start, and I think your modeling of cases and hospitalization is fantastic to inform the planning process. Cindy, there are a couple of questions that I thought would be appropriate. Um, could you remind us about the reliability, is the expression used in the question of antibody tests, when, what, what do the results actually mean? Um, and they, uh, there's a question around um, pooled testing for asymptomatic individuals. Could you comment on, on that as well? Yeah, sure. So I'll start with the pool testing for asymptomatic individuals. Um, and so, you know, as I mentioned before, I mean, this is now, I think, um, becoming a much more accepted method. In fact, there is, um, uh, it's part of the FDA regulatory review process now to use pooled methods for um, COVID testing. And so essentially what that does, what's really important when we do pool testing. So the benefit of that, of course, is increased throughput. Um, but what we need to demonstrate is that the amount of pooling that we do doesn't um, significantly affect um, the sensitivity of the assay, doesn't increase the number of false negatives. And so this is something that we're doing in the validation phase. And so um, another thing too, is that I'll mention, um, you know, false positive results is really important when we're testing in a population that has a really low prevalence. And so the one of the ways that we are also um, sort of complementing with pool testing is that we are going to apply to independent assays to um, positive pools and, um, and using that to reduce the false positive rate. Um, sorry, what's the, the other question? Antibody testing and reliability of that? Yeah, so, um, you know, this is really a great question. And I think that um, I would just say that um, I think that the way that is going to be used, um, again, as I was saying, it's not really going to be used for clinical management. And this is going to be used um, as, as a way for us to assess the the um, history of exposure in our population. And so the validation that we are doing is really focused on, um, you know, we, we really want to make sure that there are no false positives. And so that's actually how we have validated our assay to reduce um, a false positivity. And so, um, you know, I, 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 I mean, I would just say that, you know, that's, really dependent um, on how we want to use the assay. And um, so I'll just stop there. Thank you. And obviously, I think the question is stems from uh, what one of you said is the changing evidence and the changing knowledge base. So um, Amita, I, uh, I think there's a question which is very interesting around wearable technologies. The fact that we have uh, watches, et cetera, that we can actually um, uh, silently monitor things. And what is their role, if any, in COVID-19. And I wonder if I can pose a second question to you, not uh, particularly if you have knowledge of whether the GW reopening plans are looking at ventilation of rooms and thinking about HVAC systems. Is there, um, and, and if, if you feel that that's not something you can cover, I'll, I'll wait for the next round around and head it over to Dean Goldman as well. Yeah, good question. So, you know, I think that there's, as I said earlier, lots of new technological innovations and solutions that are being proposed, including wearables, uh, location tracking data, whether it's your own diary. So for example, if a contact tracer called you and asked you about your whereabouts over the last 48 hours and you know different places you've been, you know it's something that you could go to. It's not necessarily something that's being shared uh, with another entity or, or the health department. Um, in terms of wearables, yeah, I mean, I think that there's, you know, we haven't quite uh, gotten far enough in testing uh, 
a lot of those. I know that people are proposing the use of wearables, again, for location tracking, primarily in contact tracing. But, you know, I think that um, as we're learning more and more about the virus, we need to ensure that these sort of wearable solutions or other app, you know, mobile app solutions are in line with that science, you know, particularly around, you know, six feet distance, are people wearing masks, you know, um, other types of um, risk factors that come into play. So in terms of the, the second question that you posed, Adnan, on the ventilation systems, I'm going to um, ask Dean Goldman, who I know is an expert in this area, to weigh in on that. Well, I'm, I'm hardly the world's expert, but I was consulted by the university about it. And there is an effort underway. And I, I think I showed you that reference from the restaurant in Guangdong showing that ventilation could be involved with transmission. So there's been a very thorough review by GW's facilities people, building by building by building, how the HVACs work, making sure that you're not creating those air currents that can spread the virus, but also trying to fix uh, the mixing of the air to mix more fresh air in because uh, to save energy, we recirculate air, but we don't want to keep recirculating uh, the bad air. We want to breathe in the good air, breathe out the bad air. Um, and so that's a little bit different than how we generally manage our buildings. I think they are finding that a couple of our buildings are not going to be um, usable because of the ventilation problems that they have and others that they're they're working on tweaking them um, changing the changing the mixers even sometimes filtration so you know this is it's a building by building by building um, effort thank you very much to both uh, both of you Amita and, and, and Dean Goldman so Karen you've, you you must have seen some of the comments on the chat board around communications of uncertainty how do you communicate uncertainty how do you communicate the evolving nature of the evidence? Uh, what positive spin can we put on it? Is there a formal plan? Could you speak to those, those comments, please? Yes, gladly. So you're right. This has been um, a science changes, so to our communications. And that's where I love public health because we have some of the most flexible and nimble uh, people around. And we've got a fantastic communications team. And I'm really happy to say that uh, this university has recognized our communications team and how wonderful they are and are bringing them to work at the university uh, to help with that messaging um, that I think as I'm seeing in the in the chat uh, has is something that people are desperate for. They really do want uh, that consistent clear communications and I'm hoping that that um, that's coming forward. The other thing I have to say is that our how we think about DC and COVID has has flip-flopped in the past few weeks. Remember back in May, people were afraid to come to DC because as Amanda showed, the numbers were so high compared to everybody else. Now the concern is the other way, is now we're concerned with other people coming to DC. So the, the messaging is also uh, going to be a little bit different. What isn't gonna change though is our prevention efforts. So as I'm seeing some of the comments here, I, Carlos, yes, I think we need to have branded face masks uh, with the GW Public Health logo. And I, I agree with you, they have to be in a variety of colors. Why not coordinate? Why not have fun with it if we're going to wear them all the time? Um, and if I may address uh, Ami's question about when people refuse to um, adhere to these recommendations. Um, because these are a matter of, of health and illness, um, and in some, case, some ways, life and death, we need to be um, adherent to what we can do. And so there has been discussion at, especially within the School of Public Health, is um, having, if students are refusing to don a face covering, they will be in violation of an agreement they will be signing with the university. It is a privilege to be on campus. And that privilege is going to be um, a signing that you understand what you get to do and get to gain from being on campus. And so if that person is not wearing, them, wearing a face covering, they're in violation of that agreement. And second is in our academic uh, curriculum, we live by the, the, by the syllabus. 
And so there is talk about putting that into the syllabus, that the professor has the right to deny you entry into an on-campus class should you refuse to engage in the preventative efforts, and a face covering is one of those. Thank you very much, Karen, and thanks for picking up that question at the end. That, that's a really important piece. Dean Goldman, if, you, if you're available, I, um, I want to make sure that I come to a couple of uh, sort of overarching questions. One is, um, is there any danger of GW and DC being inconsistent with each other? So could you comment on, on, on that? And secondly, are urban campuses like ours uh, at higher risk than, let's say, remote colleges and remote universities in, in maybe more rural settings? So first and foremost, uh, in our whole plan for uh, reopening our campus, we take it for granted and throughout that whatever standard is at that point in time being put forth by the District of Columbia, especially DC Health, that at a minimum we comply with that. And if we are doing something different, it's because we feel we have to go above and beyond because of some special characteristics of what's going on on our campus. So, I mean, and, and we need the whole community to understand that, that, that DC may, for example, at that point in time be saying, you can have gatherings with X people, but we, the university may decide if there's been transmission of gatherings to reduce the size of gatherings below DC's threshold because of the fact that perhaps, you know, we're seeing transmission and gatherings. So that's, you know, that's kind of the principle that we've been following. Um, and um, in terms of the rural versus urban campuses, certainly the CDC did say, boy, if you're, if, you, if you're not in the middle of a major metropolitan area, that you don't have to worry as much about something like testing. Um, I'm not sure that that would necessarily be true. We, we have seen fairly large outbreaks yeah, among you know congregate populations that are isolated from other populations, whether that's happened on cruise ships or it's happened in jails or it's happened, you know, in um, all kinds of institutions. And I, I think even if you're in a rural area, if you have you know your students might leave for spring break and then be with students from all over the country and in motels or something on beaches and then return with the virus and transmit it on, on your campus. I, I, think, I think all of us in academe are going to have to be very vigilant about the opportunity for that to happen, whether we're urban or rural. Thank you very much, Dean Goldman. Amanda, there's a, there's a couple of questions around HIV and COVID, and I wanted you to jump in, and because of your expertise, uh, what's the status of COVID in people living with HIV AIDS? Do an antivirals offer any protection for COVID-19? Could you comment on those? Yeah, certainly. Um, so with, this was a really interesting um, finding because those of us that work in HIV were very concerned about um, people who were immunosuppressed and how they would fare with this virus. And it's been surprising to see um, as more and more studies have come out, you know, we actually just did a, um, a review on the a re review article on this. Um, we saw a few case studies where individuals were actually doing fine and having, you know, mild to moderate um, severe, dis mild to moderate disease and recovering well. Um, generally, those individuals who are virally suppressed who are on antiretrovirals tend to do just as well as the general population from what we're seeing. But there really haven't been any large systematic trials or studies done. Um, and so, you know, I, I give you that information with the caveat that just like everything else with COVID, we are still learning a lot about the, the virus and how it interacts, um, you know, with individuals um, depending on their immune status. Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, folks, there are about seven minutes left. I'm going to use them effectively to try and grab a few more questions and, and request my panelists to, to give uh, brief but important answers. Cindy, um, two quick questions for you. Do receptors change with age, specifically speaking of ACE2 receptors and, 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 and what is the implication of that? And is there any role for this underwater sewage testing of dorms and the sewage that comes out of dorms? I thought that was an interesting one. Okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, right. Um, so um, I, I saw the question about the ACE2 receptor expression. And so um, somebody from my lab actually answered this question. I mean, there was a paper that was published looking at ACE2 expression in different age groups and 
uh, what has been shown is that the ACE2 receptor expression is, is uh, less in younger children, um, but it's similar in adults age uh, 18 and above. And so that might be one possible explanation for why you know, disease severity tends to be less um, in younger children because the inoculum size actually does um, matter when it comes to disease severity. So when it comes to, I'm sorry, your second question has to do with uh, virus testing in sewage system. So, um, well, you know, uh, all I can say is that, you know, this is something that uh, is, is really interesting and potentially important. And I know that, you know, um, so um, I would say that this is not, uh, this is something that is currently being looked at because, you know, especially in the occupational uh, safety instance for workers who do have to work with sewage, you know, what does that mean in terms of exposure for them? But this is something that is being uh, worked on right now. Thank you, Cindy. Amita, very quickly, what would be the criteria for shutting down GW all over again? What, what, what would happen or can you give a sense of what as members of these committees would you be looking for as a, a signals? Yeah, so I think, you know, um, Amanda's slides on the metrics and thresholds is exactly what we're gonna be looking at. And so we've spent a lot of time uh, talking to other colleagues, other uh, leaders at other schools of public health, um, looking into the literature to develop those metrics and thresholds. And so one of the things that, again, you know, going back to sort of the data and technology is that we do want to, we will be providing a level of data transparency to the entire community, looking at some of those key, not all of them, but some of those key uh, metrics so that we'll all understand, you know, uh, what sort of um, what zone we are in, you know, whether or not we need to um, increase some of our precautions, as Dean Goldman said, you know, perhaps limit certain gatherings or put other um, preventive behaviors into place or other structural sort of changes into place. And all of that will be guided by the different metrics and thresholds. And we will have a dashboard that is public facing to ensure that data transparency so that everybody on the campus um, knows where, we, where we're at, what status we're in, and that they can use that information to drive their own individual um, decisions as well. Thank you very much, Amita. That's great thought. Uh, Dean Goldman, you seem to be wanting to come in on this point. Yeah, one other thing, and somebody asked about, there is also some additional space for isolating and quarantining that the university is lining up just in yeah. case it needs more. Right. Hopefully it won't. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Karen, quickly, a student becomes COVID positive. What happens? How can they be excused? Uh, a reflection mm -hmm. of that. Excellent. And that's in one of the slides. So if a student becomes positive, um, we will, the CCST will be contacting the student and acting as a sort of repository for information and acting as a communication gateway. So that we wanna facilitate that student getting into isolation and rather not having to worry about, did I tell the right people and everything. So hopefully the plan at this point is that the CCS, CCST will act as that intermediary to alert the people that need to be notified, including uh, the Department of Health, which will then also be contacting that student within 24 hours. The student will also have the colonial health personnel in contact with them since they are the medical providers for the student and easing them through the isolation process and the monitoring to be able then to um, clear them to come back to class, which is approximately going to be 10 days later. So Dean Goldman, uh, before I make a closing comment, uh, a last question to you, um, uh, and I hope you can get it to it quickly. It's a very interesting question. It's saying, what's the push to reopen before a vaccine? What's the rationale? Why do we need to do this before we have a vaccine? I thought that was an interesting question. You can use the answer to provide a closing comment as well. So the truth is we have no idea when we will have um, a vaccine that is effective for all of us and will actually stop the transmission of the virus. I believe there, I mean, we've got a vaccine right now that is in trials, that there are gonna be trials um, by the MFA at GW for that vaccine and other vaccines that are being um, um, trialed as well. But um, we don't know if this is gonna go on for just one semester, two, three, or four. We don't know how long this will go on. And meanwhile, I think that there are tremendous downsides to everything being locked down. 
And so we're not the only sector that uh, the society is trying to figure out how to make these sectors function, uh, not just higher education, but you know, what about school children? Uh, can six-year-olds learn on Zoom very well? Mine wouldn't have been able to. And what's the implication of, of for a long period of time, children um, not learning or not being in social um, um, situations? We need to do it safely. We need to, to make the investments to make it safe. And we need to draw the line with certain things. I don't think opening bars is actually a necessity. And, um, but at the same time, there's so much that has been deferred, not only the education, but healthcare and other essential functions in society. Well, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have come to 3 p.m. It's been an incredible two hours. First of all, join me in thanking and appreciating the work of uh, my five colleagues from Dean Goldman to Dr. Castell, uh, Dr. McDonald, Dr. Vyas, Dr. Liu. These represent five, but not the entire strength of the school. The school has even a vast array of individuals who are not here today, but we'll organize other sessions. We'll make sure that their expertise come to the fore. Please remember, we are trying to use the best evidence, we are trying to keep up with the evidence, and we are trying to be as transparent and ethical in the reopening of GW. Thank you for joining us today. Be safe, be well, and remember, wear a mask, be six foot away from people, make sure that you're following all your guidelines, uh, and hopefully we'll, all, we'll have a very healthy future. Good afternoon to all. Take care. Bye now. Bye.